Yes, we make a big deal about Jesus Christ, like a real big deal. I mean, Christianity, our faith, uh, Christianity means, like, uh, Christian means little Christ, right? And there are slogans you can go around, um, and there's this one church I listen to a lot of their sermons, and their slogan is, all of Christ for all of life. I've heard before another place where it's, it's all about Jesus. That's their slogan. Uh, we have songs, right? There's, there's plenty of Christ, Christ crucified, Christ magnified. There's hymns. This one hymn I really enjoy. It's only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Uh, we, we have like identities. Not only do we call ourselves Christians, but you might call yourself a Jesus freak. That was a, a bigger thing in the 90s, but it still happens every so often. We make a big deal about Jesus. And in fact, those who make a real big deal about Jesus will often tell you that they don't make a big enough deal about Jesus. Uh, and, and Paul talked about that a little bit. In 1 Corinthians 15, he says this, if we have hoped in Christ in this life only, meaning it, it wasn't real and, and there is nothing beyond this life to look forward to. If we have hoped for Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. Paul said, if we get this wrong, man, out, we should be pitied because of how much we base our life on Christ. You know, tonight for our doctrine dive, we're, we're picking this up. And again, a doctrine dive is where we're going to spend a Tuesday night going into some, um, some real doctrinal term, some, some theological term. We're going to dive deep. Uh, and it's not, it, this isn't a series we do every week. We did one two weeks ago. We probably won't do it again for a month. But um, where we just get, it's a little more meaty. Than normal. And tonight I want to talk about Christology, which is the study of the person, the nature, and the role of Christ. So that's right up there on your notes. It's the study of the person, the nature, and the role of Christ. And as I said, we make a big deal of Jesus Christ. And, and if we're doing that, we got to know why we do that. Like, what's behind that? And we got to ask ourselves, if we're doing that and we know why, are we making him the big deal that he deserves to be in our lives individually? Like, what does that look like to you? And so I want to start at the beginning. And not at the beginning when Jesus was born, because really his story goes way before that. I want to go to the beginning of the Old Testament, because Christ is spoken of throughout the Old Testament. Right, the Old Testament all points towards Jesus. I want to show you a picture right up here. Uh, can you put that up here? How many of you have seen this before? Handful of you? So these arcs right here are cross-references found in Scripture. And there's 63,000 of them. 63,000 times in Scripture, verses refer to other verses and back and forth. Now, not all of those are about Jesus Christ directly, but many, many, many of those are. And, and the way that works is if you have a study Bible and you open it up in the middle here, it will, there will be different references. Now, sometimes that reference is referring to the way that a, a specific word was used, but other times it's referencing what, like, what is being talked about. In those things. And so there are over 63,000 cross references found in Scripture. And as I said, hundreds, if not thousands, depending on how you count, point to Jesus. And it's the Old Testament pointing about who was to come and what he was going to do. Now, some of those lines, now in those cross references, you're gonna find some things like what you'll find in Psalm 22 or Isaiah 53, where it points to the time that Jesus was on the cross. And it sometimes is so specific, it will write out words that Jesus said on the cross, as in Psalm 22, 1. Why have you forsaken me? It, it talks about the crucifixion hundreds and hundreds of years beforehand. Isaiah 53, 5 talks about um, the different forms of beating 
that Jesus endured on the cross. There's verses like this, Isaiah 9. I'm going to read it. It says in verse 6 and 7, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. It's all talking about Jesus. It goes on and it says, and I love, love this verse, there will be no end, no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. You often see that on Christmas cards, and you kind of read over it quickly, and you're like, nice, is there any cash in this card? But that verse right there, those two verses, connect to five different New Testament verses and passages alone, just those two, and are quoted 24 other times in the Old Testament, or referenced. That's how our scripture works. It's all connected. In fact, people think that this is just this old, antiquated book But there is no way that something that detailed and that connected could ever be written by one of us. No offense. For sure not me, but also not you. (laughs) But what we see is the Old Testament talks about Christ and prepares a way for him hundreds and hundreds of times. But that picture that you saw, that's only talking about the cross references. There's so many things that aren't listed out in those arcs. Stories, connections, symbols, lineage, places, things like that, such as Genesis 22. If you read Genesis 22, you, that's the story of when Abraham, Abram, sorry, Abraham at that time, took Isaac, his son, and was going to sacrifice him. And in that passage, we read that Isaac carried the wood for his sacrifice. He went on a a three-day journey, climbed to the top of a mountain. And then right before he was sacrificed, God stopped Abraham and provided a substitute. A ram was caught in a thicket. But even a simple story as that, if we now look ahead, we know about Jesus who carried the wood for his crucifixion up a mountain to be sacrificed Except at that moment, God did not stop him, did not stop the Romans, because Jesus was the substitute for us. If you and I spent some time, we can look through Genesis 1, where it talks about the Trinity, and and Jesus is alluded to there. Or Genesis 3.15, which is the first Christophany, where it talks about how Jesus will someday make amends for the sin that was committed in the garden. Over and over again, Jesus Christ is talked about, pointed towards in the Old Testament. The entire sacrificial system, if you've read through your Old Testament, you went through Genesis and you're like, this is rad. You got through the first half of Exodus and you're excited. Then you hit the second half of Exodus and that's where your dedication was tested. As they start talking about the sacrificial system and the priesthood and all of that. In Leviticus, you're like, What did I get myself into? All of that points to Jesus. What happens in the Old Testament? Well, you sin. And when you sin, what do you do? Well, you need to go make a sacrifice. You sacrifice an animal to atone for your sins. Well, we know in 1 Peter 4, 9, that Jesus is called the sinless, spotless lamb. All of that system was pointing to towards Jesus and what he would do for us. I'm not done. People point to Jesus. There's this literary ter- term called a type, and it's a person or a figure who foreshadows a greater person or a greater figure to come. Joshua is one such type. Joshua in the Old Testament, his name means God saves, and he leads the people from the wilderness into the promised land. Jesus is a variation of the same name, Joshua. Jesus' name means God saves, and he leads us, the lost, into eternal security from here into heaven. And there's over and over again, in fact, you guys, if you just want to nerd out with me sometime, let's just, just bug me, and we'll go over more and more details like this. 
that all point to Jesus Christ. Christ is a big deal. And he was a big deal far, far before the time he came and walked this earth. The Old Testament is all pointing towards him. But then he arrives. And we know that Christ descended from heaven and lived a perfect life. That next blank on your, your sheet is the word incarnation. Do you have it up there? I don't know if you do. Yes. Incarnation. And it literally means taking on flesh. And this is the term used. In fact, if you see it capitalized, capital I, the incarnation of Christ, it's referring to when Jesus Christ lowered himself from heaven and took on flesh. And Jesus, who is God, came to earth. Now, this one's confusing. In fact, I like tripping junior hires and high schoolers up. You ask them, hey, is Jesus God? And a lot of them are like, well, uh, no, he's the son of God. And they're wrong, but they're right. He is the son of God, but he is also God. And you see, Jesus, who always has been God, came down to earth as human. And he did it through God, the, through the Holy Spirit, God, and Mary. Now, he was born to a virgin mother. Jesus was consumed, sorry, conceived in the womb of his mother, Mary, who was a virgin. Yeah, I know. Uh, now, you, I don't know on yours. Let me see this. Yeah, you have your references there. I want to leave a ton of verses here, and I don't have time to go through them all. But whenever I do a doctrine dive like this, I really, really want you to know like, it is very important to me that I don't trip up. I don't even, like, misspeak, even though I just said consumed and not conceived. Um, I don't, I want to do this well. And so there's scripture there you can, you can check out. And if you have any other follow-up questions, please always come to me. But this was a miracle. Clearly, a virgin cannot have a baby. But God became man through Mary, and God chose a virgin because, one, it's a miracle. Two, it fulfills prophecy, which was spoken about beforehand because Jesus Christ has been a big deal for a while. But it also made room for less confusion when it came to, is this actually baby? Is this baby from God? Well, Mary had never known a man. And the Bible says that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit. It says in Luke 135, the angel answered her and said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. So what we see is Jesus, who is God and was God before he walked on the earth, came, became man through Mary, who was a virgin, who was conceived um, through the Holy Spirit she conceived, and this answers a lot of the problems that we would face if we tried to earn our own salvation. You see, you and I, we are sinners. And you and I, we were born sinners. We started out that way because we're descendants of Adam. Your dad isn't God, neither is mine, and that's not a knock on them. They're not. So we're born sinners. So even if we wanted to, to start trying to figure out how to solve all of this on our own, it's too late. But Jesus Christ was not born of Adam. In fact, if you, you want some extra study later, I want to encourage you to read Romans 5, where it talks about through Adam, sin entered the world. And through Adam, all men are sinners. But through Christ, so did righteousness. And so if you are born of Adam, you are a sinner. But if you are reborn of Christ, you, can be just, you are justified. Paul calls Christ the new Adam in that. So I'm, I'm kind of, I, I want to set the stage because Jesus was talked about. He, the stage was set for him. Then he arrives, and he arrives in this miraculous way. But that doesn't even fully speak of his figure and form. You see, Jesus was 100% man and 100% God. At the bottom of your page, that's what, where it says hypostatic union. Now, this doesn't make any sense to us, uh, and yet it makes complete sense to God. 
You see, Jesus has always been God. So when it says he's 100% man and 100% God, the God, he, he's always been God. But he laid aside many of the privileges that he had in his divine nature in order to walk as man. So there are things that Jesus chose to remove from himself so that he can come and accomplish the role that God called him to accomplish. But Jesus became man, and not partially. Like sometimes we want to write off, well, he was kind of man. No, he was fully man. It says in Philippians 2, having this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So Jesus dealt with all the limitations that, that you have. He was hungry. He was thirsty. He was tired. The only thing that he didn't have that we have is a sin nature, and that's because he was not born of Adam. He was born of God. And then he lived a perfect life. 1 John 3, 5, I want to flip to it. I don't have it up there for you. But it says that you know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there was no sin. He was perfect. And all of this matters. All of this is necessary all of this not only adds to why we make a big deal about Christ, but without it, we could not make a big deal about Christ. In order for Jesus to, to do what he was called to do, he had to come in this manner. He had to walk in this way. And what I love is he, he did this because we were separated from the Father. And we there's that saying, we bore a debt we could never pay, so Jesus paid a debt that he never owed. You guys have heard that before? We, the debt we owed, we couldn't pay. It was beyond us. Not only because we were born in sin, but we've continued to sin. We, we can't do it. But the, the truth is God needed man to pay the debt. So he sent his son to take our spot. And so Jesus walked as a man so that he could pay the debt that we owed. And his humanity should give us great comfort. Because what it means is there's nothing that you've endured or felt or been tempted with that Jesus didn't know himself. Jesus was tempted whether you look in Matthew 4 or you, you look at 1 Corinthians 10, 13, where it says all sin that is common to man, he dealt with. But all of these things made a way for what Jesus was going to do. Let me read one more verse and we'll get into that. Hebrews 4, 14 says this. Therefore, since we have a great high priest... See, that, that term high priest, is, that's referring to the sacrificial system that we used to have and that the man who would lead all of that. Well, Jesus is who that is for us now. And says, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace and help to help in time of need. There are a lot of faiths that try to tweak a little bit who Jesus Christ was. Some of them try to own the name of Christianity, but I would argue aren't, can't, can't do that properly because they change who Jesus was or how he came. They want to write off that he wasn't divine 
or that he, wasn't, he didn't live a perfect life. Or they, they just tweak little things. But our role is not to change who Christ was, but to be changed by who Christ is and what he did for us. And each of these things matter and, and add to why we make such a big deal of who he was and what he did. The third point there is Christ suffered on the cross to pay our debts. He was buried and three days later rose again. There's a big space there because that's where you're going to write this word up there, penal substitutionary atonement. And we talked about this a little bit before. And Katie wanted to torture you by putting that as a blank. Well done, Katie Jones. But this is all saying that Jesus took the punishment on the cross that we, we owed, that we deserved for our sin. And it was a brutal death, as I alluded to earlier, 50, Isaiah 53, 4 through 5, talk about that. And he fully died because he was paying the debt for sin and the wages of sin are death. And he fully rose again. And here's what's interesting. If you take away the resurrection, he still pays the debt. And so there's this question, why does he need to rise again? But Jesus Christ is God, and he has authority and power over death. And by rising again, we have confidence in everything. It confirms everything that he said. Paul puts it this way in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, for if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. And then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we of all men are most to be pitied. But now Christ has been raised from the dead. And he goes on in verse 54 of chapter 15. He says, but when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, when we die and we put on, we, we step into our eternal state. And this mortal will have put on immortality. Then we will come about saying that that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus died, but then he rose again, proving everything. And the Bible said he ascended into heaven, and he's sitting on the right hand of God where he rules, and rightly so. And God orchestrated all of this so that we could know the Father once again. It says there, your second and last point is Christ is the bridge to the Father. You know that verse, John 14, 6, where he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And there are so many other faiths that want to figure out a different way. Look, Jesus Christ is the way, but also if you do this work, you'll find the way too but that's not it. Or Jesus Christ is a way, but you can find a different way through this. That's not it. It's Jesus Christ or nothing. It's not your work. It's not your merit. It's Jesus Christ who makes a way to the Father. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, and that man is Christ Jesus. Acts 4.12, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven than has been given among men by which we must be saved. <clears throat> we can't elevate ourselves. We can't diminish Christ. We're called to follow and submit to him. So all of that begs the last question, which is, do you make a big deal about Christ? Because it says that Christ is worthy of our lives. <clears throat> and 
And I think about all those songs and all those slogans and all, all, all of it. Um, and really, that's not, that's not it. Like, you, you could memorize all those things. You could sing them. You could wear the shirts. You could get tattooed. Before you do that, look at my message that I talked about a, a bit ago about that. You, like, there's, there's all these things we can do, but, but the tr- true sign that Christ is everything to you is, is, is he your Lord and Savior? Have you surrendered to him? And are you walking in his ways? Jesus said, if you love me, you will follow my ways. Paul, the same guy who said, man, if we hope in Christ in this life only, then we're most among men to be pitied. He also said this in Philippians 3. He says, more than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is, in, which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Can I have the band come up? Paul here is saying, I want every aspect of my life to be about Jesus Christ. I think about Christianity and how much we've made it about Jesus Christ, and he is deserving of that all. But I think about our faith in our walks, and I must ask myself, is that how, how my life or my faith would be described too? Uh, am I holding Christ in esteem the way he deserves? Am I worshiping the way he deserves? I want to encourage you guys, this doctrine dive is just this brief overview of all these things. In fact, you can spend just a countless amount of hours studying any one of these big terms. And, and frankly, I, I think that uh, I, I'm not getting caught up reading the three, 400 page books about just one of these terms, but I could do more to study, to understand, and to to really honor what Christ has done. Especially in light of all the other ways that I spend my time. So I want to challenge you with this. What role does Christ play in your life? And where could you lift them up further? Or what are the things that maybe are in the way or that you've put in place or that you've idolized before him? Because God made a big deal about him. He is a big deal, and I, I think he's deserving of our lives.